nationality because status means nothing from an immigration standpoint. Why? Because there's about 200 different ways to prove immigration status in this country. If you're from Canada, you don't have to have a visa to enter the United States. So if you drive, if you're going on a vacation, driving down through Arizona, and you get pulled over by the police, what do you, what do you use to prove your status in this country? There simply isn't a document, right? You entered legally, you were inspected and admitted, but you don't have any proof of status from a federal perspective or from a state perspective. So just by driving through the state, you've committed a state crime. Okay? And I think about all my other clients who have status but wouldn't be able to show it. Victims of domestic violence. Victims of domestic violence often get a document called deferred action, which means you're in the queue to get your green card, but like so many other types of immigration benefits, it's going to take eight years for you to get there. So we're going to give you this document that's called deferred action. And what it means is we won't deport you until your green card comes through. And then when your green card comes through, you'll have proof of status. But you think a police officer from Maricopa County is going to understand what deferred action is? I think of my clients who have significant benefit parole. Guess where they got that? From the Drug Enforcement Agency. They're snitches. They're informants. You, they, you get pulled over, you think they can just pull out their DEA card, showing that they're a witness for a federal prosecution against a drug lord? So status itself is an amorphous concept. There are easy ones, green cards, work permits, right? Th those are easy ones. But it, it takes care of about 10% of the universe of what we call status from an immigration standpoint. So is the law not enforced because it doesn't make sense? Maybe, arguably. But more importantly, it doesn't, it's not enforced because there's no practical way to enforcement, enforce it. And that brings me full circle to what I want to talk about from, from our perspective, and that is Colorado. So in Colorado in 2006, there was a lot of political movement to get tough on immigration. It was an election year. Uh, Republicans were coming out really strongly against immigration. And the Democrats said, we've got to get tough on immigration. So there was a number of bills passed out of our state legislature, including one called SB 90. What SB 90 says is that if you get pulled over for anything more than a five-point traffic offense, basically what that means is anything that requires a court appearance, okay, then the police officer, upon reasonable suspicion, is required to call immigration. Okay? But there's no lawsuit. Like You can't sue a police officer if he fails to do his job. He's just required to call immigration. We've had that law since 2006. Right? It already exists. So the question is, how does Arizona take it a step further? Well, first of all, it, it adds the civil remedy for private citizens to sue the police. But it also adds the other components. It makes it a state crime to fail to have proof of lawful status. So a previous speaker brought up the point of you know, the costs of this litigation and for that to be on the horizon. What, what does it mean to you and I? Well, the fact is, is that these laws do test the outer bounds of constitutionality. That's, their, that's what they're there for. I mean, they're not shameless about it. Joe Arpaio has come out and blatantly said, I'm not going to follow. Napolitano is not my boss. I don't report to her. I'm not going to follow what she has to say. Hillary Clinton and Janet Napolitano have said, we are going to consider suing the state of Arizona for violating federal preemption laws, right? I mean, even the federal government is saying, we're going to sue you, Arizona. So the fact is, is that we know that these laws test the outer bounds of constitutionality. What that means to you and I is that people are going to get sued for racial profiling. Citizens are going to sue for freedom of travel, right, which is one of our constitutional rights. People are going to sue based on freedom to assemble, day laborers, their ability to assemble to try and find jobs. There are going to be lawsuits filed, and the cities the states, the attorney generals, the city attorneys are going to have to pay to enforce the law and just to, to go to, to, to suit on these laws, which means that we are going to have to pay for them. Okay. In the state of Colorado right now, on Governor Ritter's desk for signature is something called a memorandum of understanding between the state and uh, Homeland Security called Secure Communities. Okay. Secure Communities takes SB 90 one step further. What we have in Colorado now is a requirement 
that a police officer or a law enforcement agent call immigration if they have reasonable suspicion that somebody that they stop is undocumented. Secure, secure communities will allow the police officer to actually access immigration databases to make the determination on the spot. Okay, so when they pull somebody over, if they have reasonable suspicion to believe that the person is undocumented, they will actually be able to access the databases of immigration. Okay, now you might think, well, that's a good thing, right? Because they're not making the status determinations themselves. They're calling it, they're, they're able to access the database itself to make the determination. But it, it begs the question, what determines reasonable suspicion? And at the heart of the Arizona law, at the heart of the Colorado laws, at the heart of the problem with all of this, to me, is that fundamental issue. What creates the articulable basis for reasonable suspicion? If I drive through Arizona in my Chevy Suburban with my four kids in tow, am I going to cre create articulable suspicion? If my neighbor, who's a Hispanic individual, drives through the state of Arizona with his family in tow, will that create articulable suspicion? And to me, that's the fundamental root of the problem. And that's where I think lies the rub in terms of these lawsuits. Because you can, do, you can justify them all day in terms of immigration policy and attrition and you know, border policy, but at the end of the day, an individual officer is going to be making a determination about whether somebody is illegal or not. And they're going to be making that determination based on color based on dress, based on language. And those determinations are where the law gets dangerous. Okay. Now, the broader picture, immigration policy, uh, you know, it may surprise you to know that I'm sort of opposite of what other people have said on the panel and that I'm actually a, a big proponent of a very strong border and a very strongly regulated immigration system. And here's why. Having done this for 10 years, the default visa system that we have in this country is illegal immigration, right? We have visas for professionals. If you have a four-year degree, you can get a visa. If you have a million dollars and can employ 10 full-time workers, we've got a visa for you, right? If you're a multinational executive, there's a visa for you. But for 75% of our industry, meat packers, farm workers, you know, nursing assistants, truck drivers, construction workers, janitors. For 75% of the industry, there is no visa category at all. If you're an unskilled worker, or an essential skills worker, as I like to refer to them, the only visa that you can get is if you're in agriculture or you're in a job that's less than one year. Okay? So if you work in the Vail Ski Resort and you're a ski lift operator, there's a visa for you. But if you're in a job that's 364 days a year, there's no visa category available. And as long as there are not US workers to fill those jobs, supply and demand, simple economics, is going to mitigate in favor of illegal immigration. So the reason I'm in favor of a regulated visa system is because I want to take the border out of Colorado. I want to put the border back where it belongs, right? <laughs> at the actual border. As long as we don't have a regulated system, the border is going to move, continue to move closer and closer to my neighborhood. And that's why, from a fundamental perspective, I believe the problem lies not with the state of Colorado or the state of Arizona or Fremont, Nebraska. It lies with the federal government, and that's where it belongs. And so this is a wake-up call. This is a mandate for the federal government to do its job. If you don't want it in your backyard, then demand that your congresspeople take action and do what we elected them to do. Pass immigration reform. Thanks.